Our guest today is Binod Shankar, someone who we have come to know very well over many years. Based in Dubai, Binod is well known across the Middle East as the founder of what is now known as Kaplan Genesis, the leading providers of training for chartered accountants in the region. Now, Binod is a regular TV pundit on financial and economic affairs, and is a passionate advocate of proactive strategies for success in life and in work. Now, Binod has turned his attention to becoming a successful coach for aspiring chartered accountants and business leaders. Since training in the use of the mental toughness concept, he's also incorporated that into much of his work. Now, what makes this podcast really interesting is that Binot is one of the most thoughtful and inquisitive people we know, and he reflects on everything he comes across. Usefully, he's prepared to share those reflections with anyone who's prepared to listen to him, which is what makes these podcasts really valuable. He's always interesting. He's never dull. We welcome Binod to this discussion. I'm interested, Binod. You, the, a lot of the uh, focus of your book and your thinking, and we've had many, many conversations, is about the individual, mm. about the individual doing mm. things for themselves. But the individual mm. isn't always in control of the environment. And one of the things that we're beginning to look at is, you know, if you're in employment, the organisation. Do you think mm. organisations understand what we've been talking about? That they've got talent in their organisation that is not being optimised or used? And if they were to become aware of that, how could they release that talent? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, and I've often thought about that, uh, Kazan. When, when we know that people drive businesses in terms of I'm talking bottom line, right? And that culture is so important and so is employee retention, et cetera, et cetera, and engagement. Why is it that we have so many workplaces where mental health is a serious issue because of you know, bullying and harassment and overwork and things like that? And I think, I mean, this is just my speculation. I think, uh, I think human, I think people are complex they are, and, and, uh, the relationship between it's not linear relationship right you don't, you don't get instant responses from people instant performance from people people need to be coached they need to be motivated they need to be supervised and companies sometimes don't just have the time or the inclination to do that because they're so focused on the short-term financial results and so they don't invest in a lot of the efforts that would normally make for a conducive work atmosphere uh, that whether it is coaching or training or mentoring or or giving study leaves or maternity leaves, or I mean, there's a long list, a huge list. And so they sort of take shortcuts and that's what happens a lot of the time because the CEOs want to be shown as delivering results because shareholders expect results. So it's all tied together, right? And because the stock market expects the results. So um, I'm not trying to excuse the behavior of leaders and companies. I'm just trying to say why they might be behaving that way because incentives drive behaviors as we all know <clears throat> and the biggest incentives that we have in a, in a, in a listed company for example is uh, stock price and profits and they are strongly related now on the flip side someone was saying that's true but for the long-term financial health of the company you still need to focus on people so why are not people thinking about that um, especially if it's a people business like consulting or training or something like that um, the answer is because probably CEO tenors are very short and CEOs just want to make sure that they nail the performance in a year's time. And then they move on, right? After one or two years, that's not the problem anymore. And then they kick the can down the road for the next guy to solve and probably never get solved. That's my hypothesis about what's happening in the workplace these days. Um, the, despite all the talk about, you know, ESG and diversity and inclusion and equality, in some cases, real. In some cases, it's just superfluous stuff, mostly for optics in some companies. But I think that's what's driving. I mean, at the end of the day, um, like Milton Friedman said, I mean, you basically companies have only one purpose, and that is to make profits. And I think that's the core of what's happening. Has happened for I mean, decades, right? Not changed much, despite all the 
what you call public relations and marketing campaign being put out. Well, it's also worrying because I think uh, ever since COVID, uh, the issue of uh, workplace wellness has become even more urgent and important. And since I'm a coach and I, I, I'm still in touch with hundreds of my former students who are now in mid to senior level positions, they all, most of them tell me it's just hard to work. Um, I was just talking to somebody today and he was talking about having six bosses to work with. Yeah. And yeah. Well, not six bosses, we call them stakeholders and each of the stakeholders had different expectations and mm. there's a huge organization, different expectations and different priorities and everyone had to be kept happy. So mm. he found that at the end of the job, his job was just to keep people happy and not so much deliver anything to clients, you know? <laughs> so the second part of it is the politics, of course. So first part was the commercial profit focus. Second part, I think, is politics. Um, and that happens when there are limited resources, limited positions, lots of people chasing them, and uh, people want everything today. Mm -hmm. They don't want to wait for next year. So, so I think what's happening is a combination of politics and uh, focus on short-term commercial gains. I don't know how or whether it will change and when, um, probably it's always been there since, I mean, thousands of years. It's just manifesting itself in a different way these days. Um, mm. And yeah, I mean, what do you think, I mean, uh, of, of why why people don't, why companies I like, don't? I like, I like that you've used Milton Friedman because I'm yes. quite a big fan of Friedman. He's, right. he's okay. I suppose, a prototype behavioral economist. He did understand hmm. that. Mm. But I mean, I, the thing that I would pick up is, did he believe that or was he observing that? Because <clears throat> if you think about it, the purpose of an organization might well be to be, create profit or create wealth. I prefer mm. that, mm. that phrase. He can create mm. wealth in all sorts of different ways. So if you look at somebody like uh, Coca-Cola that's been around forever, Correct. they've never ever thought, I can't imagine that they think in short term, you know, mm. Mm. They must think, you know, how will we still be here in 10 years' time? And right. <clears throat> they're developing their policies. Uh, we are beginning to do a bit more work in the world that you're familiar with. We don't do much direct delivery. We do it mo work mostly through partners. Mm. But we're working with professional firms and with financial services organisations in the main at the moment. Mm. Mm. And with, they're coming to us because they know they've got a problem. What we're finding is they don't recognise the problem. Yes. And quite literally, I had I was working with a group of people uh, a few weeks ago, and they they acknowledged they had a well-being problem. And there were people in that audience who said they were about to fall over, and then suddenly, mm. um, one of the very senior leaders said, "Just a minute, we're a very successful organisation. We're a high-performance organisation." We're hitting all our targets. What is mm. the problem? And he killed the conversation. He killed it all. And you can just see people in the audience thinking, well, I'm just at the end, edge of, end of my tether. Yeah. And he thinks everything's fine. Mm. So when you get people who kind of really understand, and I think that's kind of compassionate uh, approach mm. to business, mm. you know, understanding what's happening to those resources, we will struggle, but we are beginning to see some of that. I mean, the organization approached us in the first place yes. to, to deal with the problem, and then we find they don't recognize the problem. So, mm. Mm. I, 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 think it's, I think it's a good observation because there are no doubt, and ultimately these are the organizations you don't tend to hear as much from, but there are organizations where, look, if they're on, if they're on the stock exchange, they're... Yes at least somebody within that organization, their primary goal is to bring about returns yes. for shareholders, which means it doesn't matter if things are already going well, you've got to try and grow, 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 change, change, yes. change. Okay. And, and whenever there's change, some people have to have to deal with that. And it, and it is, it, there's, there's definitely this sometimes sort of tokenistic, like they're not managing all this stress we're putting on them. They're the problem. They need to be yes. better at managing stress. 
<laughs> and then they go, they want to get in touch for it, you know, um, to to have a, a webinar or a training session or or something like that. But that's, uh, but I don't want to tar everyone with that brush. I think there's a, you know, it's very it's a very complex picture where I'm sure some organisations very good at the top, some might have some people like that, but then they're within the kind of directorship or middle management. There'll be some fantastic yeah. people that do genuinely. Yes. Um, care about their employees but we I, I think there's a there's a danger within coaching and positive psychology and mm. and well-being movements that if 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 we don't kind of take a critical eye on the organizational and the systemic structures mm. we, I think that's why programs fail so often yeah, sure. because Look, if if I if I have too much work to do, no amount of strategies and change in my mental toughness is going to change that bit. I might just last another couple of months before I completely reach the end of my tether. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it's a it's a good observation. And I, what I'd say, Bernard, it's a real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, real. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Just, just so I just want to make a short comment here because just thinking as you're speaking and about um, this whole, so I was having a chat with a senior manager a year ago and I asked him a very simple question. Why is it that most or many people at senior or middle level don't, are not self-aware? And his answer was immediate and it made perfect sense. He said, you know, that's because they are preoccupied and in some cases obsessed with the outside world. They have no time to reflect. Mm. So the point I'm trying to make, John, is that if you don't have time to reflect, you don't know yourself. If you don't know yourself, you can't know others, right? There's a direct mm. connection, it's my experience. So a lot of this actually is what we talked about, why company culture is such, is because managers simply don't understand how people work. Mm. They are used to dealing with tasks, things, projects, you know, um, formulas, calculations, uh, models, but people don't work that way. And mm-hmm. I think that's reflected in, I, mean, I, should, I should think like that. I have to confess, you know, I, have, I should say when I was in my 30s and early 40s, probably, I used to think, why don't people all work like me? Or why are they mm-hmm. all like me? You, know, you have this universal model in your mind. Um, I don't think about the fact that people have vastly different upbringings and whatever, you know, talents and, 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 and challenges and opportunities and things like that. And I think that's the reason why um, we, we have... Apart from the fact that if you want to dig deep into each person's psyche, it just takes a lot of time. Which companies decide that mm. no, that's not really good use of their time. Why bother? Why, why have one, one set of one way of dealing with John versus one way of dealing with Bino and another one with Fox Dog? When we can just say you have the standard policies and procedures applicable to everyone, irrespective of who you are, and that won't sit well because you're you're looking for the average employee, and there is no average employee. Uh, there's no one size fits all right approach. So it's it's a mix of lack of introspection, lack of self awareness, lazy thinking, standardized rules. Because <clears throat> standardized rules also allow you to scale, right? Um, mm. it, you are, you are, I mean, once you don't have the bother of dealing with each employee, then it just becomes so easy to just say, you know we're just hiring, firing, promotion, everything becomes so much easier. Um, yeah, and and I suppose in the um, sort of previous, more industrial kind of yes. workplaces. It was people were, workers were more homogenous. Really, you could kind of replace right. one with another. But yes. given given the current uh, work sectors, you know the, the growth of knowledge work and going forward, where that's only going to increase. Yes. Um, to to see workers as this sort of homogenous group we mm. swap out one for another um so it'd be very very naive yes so yeah i i just had um uh, one more thing i'd like to ask you about binod because uh i i know it's probably not as central to what you do now but i'm sure people would be interested so for for many years you've helped people train to be able to pass the cfa exam okay so which is uh you'll you can obviously explain more about what it is 
but it's a it, accountancy exam that lots of people fail because it's very hard to do essentially that's my understanding of it um so uh, could you could you talk to that a little bit in terms of how do you how do you help someone prepare to uh, perform well in that kind of um performance setting because an exam could be you know an exam could be a driving test could be yeah. um a job interview could be a sports thing could be a music recital you know mm. How, mm. how do you go about preparing somebody to um execute a performance under a pressurized condition well interestingly so the way i run my sessions um was to simulate a lot of that exam pressure in the classroom in some shape or form and that could be in the form of intense discussions rather than just lecture 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 mm. drag them into the conversation make them think why am i studying this right why why on earth should i sit at 8 pm at night after a long day at work and understand multiple regression analysis for example mm-hmm. um so that was one second was connecting the big picture for them so when you're teaching i always try to say you are learning this because it's connected to this you need to know this for this so as an example accounting is seen as a very mundane and boring topic but it's absolutely indispensable tool for investment analysis mm-hmm. because accounting is is a business language and i always say understand accounting you understand the grammar of business mm-hmm. how financial statements are prepared so once you start making this links this connections in the minds of people rather than treating subjects as silos uh people see the relevance of why mm-hmm. they're studying that topic uh and once they say rel- and they say no, relevance is one of the huge drivers of motivation right so then they get motivated not all of them some of them do get it and say ah okay so this is why they're studying this subject because it has either a practical application or it is linked to some other subject in the curriculum or i can even use it in my personal life to manage my own finances or something or work where i'm working right now so you make those connections and and um, and that's and of course getting you no know, staying real you know sort of using that term is there's no sugar coating of anything uh, at least in my classes which is to be listen this is what you need to do to get there right um i've been there done that myself passed the exams i know what it takes i taught many batches before this is a process you have to trust the process mm-hmm. right and be consistent and it's not about being brilliant or be exceptionally talented you just have to just to slog on right just slog on um yeah. like the bridge say right uh, be bloody minded about it just <laughs> put your nose down just go for it and inevitably uh, you will you will make it it's not that tough an exam if so it's it's, it's a mix of uh, well, well mental toughness of course comes in there and i remember having a couple of mental toughness sessions for my students as the exams approached and in fact i think our session 10 years ago did have or, or i think a qr has a module or something on exam students for some mental toughness for you, students you right? can pass yeah yes yeah, yeah. yes yes so i remember referring to that long not too long ago and giving some tips during my sessions and i'm sure some of it landed and yeah you know, they probably use that thing mm. so but the real kicker the real ingredient for success uh, john is all of that but i think is the passion for the for for the learning mm. process i mean it doesn't matter how much be not stand there and how good he is if you really enjoy learning you will learn regardless of who is standing in front of you to be honest you will pick it up you will go to youtube you will google you will read different books you will talk to people you will learn Yeah, curious mm-hmm. We started off by talking about confidence. One mm-hmm. of the things that I've seen in schools is mm-hmm. very talented, clever kids who know their stuff but don't believe that they know it. And so, you know, things like we we've actually seen this, they look at an exam question, say I can't do that, and then mm-hmm. when you sit down with them and talk it through, they actually do know the answer. They just don't have the confidence. in the yes, cells right. to be able yes, to put the answer in did, did you find that in with with your students yes uh, quite a few situations um I, the lot of students i think difficult to put a number or a percentage but many students i've seen 
suffered because of lack of application because more yeah, of yeah. and some of them if i recollect uh, did have this issue of yes they actually knew this stuff but they just didn't want to attempt the practice test or do those exercises because they felt they would fail and i distinctly remember this particular student actually it happened about 9 years ago she would simply refuse to do any practice tests whatsoever if right. not a single exercise and she was a banker so she knew her stuff at least and when i asked her why her answer was startling to me she said i don't want to fail and i know i'll fail and you're not talking about the exam you're talking about just practice test the online yeah, yeah. modules so i found that eventually she passed the exam with some prompting logic from my side but, but i found the fascinating as to how you, know, you, you basically you've visualized failure already you know you you you've you've lost the battle before it even started in your mind you know? mm. and that's i think a place where a lot of people go to so yeah i've seen that in class uh, done um but once they start going back to the just do it thing right what to start doing it and then realize holy shit it's not that difficult you know? it's mm. it's, it's stuff that i knew in college actually at least level 1 of cfa stuff i studied in college maybe not not too long ago but i remember it now it's not that difficult classes okay. help i've got students around me who i can ask and this support group and suddenly before they know it yeah so just just crack, get get on cracking with it i think was a solution for me at least yeah i i think what was really interesting is the way you describe uh those things you know they actually they correlate pretty well with the sort of two additional bits of the model that we added when we created mm. the mcq plus as opposed to the mcq 48 so right. you spoke about understanding the why the purpose mm. so mm. our commitment scale used to just be kind of this unidimensional stick at something you just keep going mm. and the reason we ended up creating two subscales of that the achievement orientation mm. which is that keep going yes um, and then the goal orientation which was really having that sort of purpose as to why you're going it came out of because practitioners told us those kind of things and then you mentioned sort of passion for learning and you describe you the the banking example there mm. so we used to see challenge very much in terms of sort of stress appraisal you know mm. if you're prepared to push yourself outside your comfort zone um uh, but the learning orientation we developed what we find is that when people have a a a realistic perspective of what failure entails and mm. understand if you do fail if you just do it and it doesn't work out that's yeah. fine you learn from that yeah and then you get it right next time yeah um and people with that sort of high learning orientation uh don't have that kind of oh what if i fail this would be terrible that would be terrible and that's fine like yeah. you, you want to succeed but go for it and um just do it and yeah. uh, uh, uh worst case scenario you learn something like yeah. yeah so so it's interesting that the sort of the the two kind of main things you sort of pick out are the mm. probably the things we've learned over the last 10 years um right. to to sort of further develop our, our model as well. Well, Bernard, I think that's a, a great point to which to stop. I think there's been a we knew it was going to be a great conversation and you've certainly uh, lived up to that. I, I love the ideas that you put out about we are more similar than we like to think, but we're also yeah. more different than we like to think. I mm. mean it sounds odd, but it's actually true. And I really like this has been a different session to a lot of the other sessions where we've kind of touched upon a number of topics but we've actually done a deep dive into confidence in this one mm. I think that's quite important mm. this yes really like what what you've said about confidence and about this notion that the shame of failure is greater yes. than the prospect of success and that mm. is true for a lot of people and it is just a mental thing it isn't mm. a you know, skills or a knowledge based thing it's a mental yeah. thing so there's some brilliant learning for it, for it in this and i hope it sits comfortably with with your book because there's a lot of learning sure. in your book as well certainly so yeah. yes 
that, thank, available thank you so in all good bookshops and all good bookshops <laughs> online, all, 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 online bookstores amazon.com yeah. um, for sure and well, what's the best way if um, if anyone's thinking wow i'd love to get in touch with this guy what a fountain of knowledge and insight uh what's the best way for them to contact you binod well i'm quite active on linkedin john so binod shankar on linkedin yeah. um that's me there uh, they can also reach out to me on my on my email as binod b i n o d dot shankar s h a n k a r at gmail dot com.